Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Real Wealth Solutions Podcast. Back again with uh, my co-host, Darren Light. Today, we're happy to be joined by Savannah Arroyo, uh, the net worth nurse, um, specializing in uh, syndications in, in the, the Oregon area. Uh, good morning, Savannah. Welcome. Would you, would you mind just starting out with the, the typical bio information so everybody can get uh, a little more familiar with you? Yeah, definitely. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you guys for having me. I am from Northern California. So I grew up in Sacramento and I went to nursing school at Sacramento State University, worked in a couple of different specialties right out of college and naturally gravitated towards leadership positions and different specialties. I was always taking on process improvement initiatives at hospitals I worked at. So I ended up going back to school and I got my master's degree in nursing leadership and administration. So right now in Los Angeles, California, I oversee multiple departments at a hospital here. And I got into real estate investing when I was on maternity leave with my second daughter. My husband and I just started looking for alternative investment strategies. We wanted, we were putting a huge chunk of our money towards retirement plans, and we just wanted to have more accessibility to the money that we were investing, not being able to touch this money until we were 65 just didn't really seem feasible for a growing family and kind of what we wanted to do with our life. So we looked into real estate investing and For obvious reasons, it's one of the best strategies out there to create wealth and investment strategies. And we started investing in single family homes originally. And then shortly after we switched into multifamily syndications. And that's currently what we're doing. I have two questions right off the bat. (laughs) Number one, were you an athlete growing up? Yes. Uh, For some reason, I your leadership, you went right into leadership about nursing. And I'm like, okay, I think, I think I'm just, I haven't even read all of your bio like Greg has. So I'm like, yeah, <laughs> maybe an athlete. And number two, you and your husband self-managed, which is awesome. Uh, does he have a W-2 or is this what he does full-time now? No, he has a W-2. So the plan is to get him out of that within three to five years. Um, but right now we are both working full-time. And did you guys, you started in single family. Did you discover multifamily, knew that it was out there? Did someone, did you educate yourself, go pay for education? How did that come about? Yeah, um, it was really just listening to podcasts. That was really one of my biggest forms of inspiration, motivation, education. And while I was listening to podcasts, some of the guests I heard said one thing they wish they would have done sooner was start scaling through multifamily and just the different returns. And I I mean, you don't think it's something you can do coming into real estate on your own, thinking you could take down a multifamily apartment deal, right? I mean, it just doesn't really Mm -hmm. seem feasible. As I started learning about it and syndications and the structure that these provide of investors pooling together their capital to take down these bigger deals. It just seemed like the perfect fit because we started generating interest from our friends and family and people we worked with about investing in real estate, especially after what we had done. And so we saw a huge opportunity there to kind of provide this um, investment strategy to other people in our lives by operating these deals. And we did sign up for a coaching mentorship program. And that was really to give us the confidence and the foundation to take that first step. There's a a lot of differences from single family home. A lot of the underwriting process is a lot different. There's a lot of different things to take into consideration. The legalities of structuring a syndication deal and raising money from other people was a big switch for us. And so we invested our um, time and money into a coaching program because we're working full time, two young daughters. We wanted to make sure that we were doing everything by the book. That's yeah, awesome. right on. In fact, I recognized <clears throat> some of the spreadsheet. I think we share the same uh, mentorship program. We've I've invested in a couple of them. I mean, just very quickly, was that something that you identified? It seems like you went from, hey, we're going to do some real estate, and you've done like a ton of stuff in the past. I'm guessing it's three or four years from. Oh, less than two. Yeah. Okay. Less than two years. Yeah. Yeah, Just, just looking at how you, you branded yourself, how you're creating content, how you're doing, uh, you know, I talked, caught a glimpse of your investing for real, uh, healthcare professionals webinar thing. So you, you've really kind of gone all in very quickly. Um, 
did you recognize the the mentorship as as this will be the accelerator or was it simply just I don't have enough education or both I guess more of the education piece. I mean, yeah, like you're saying, we're really big action takers. The accountability aspect of the coaching mentorship, the, which a lot of people invest in a coach mentor to have that accountability. My husband and I didn't really need that. We were very set on what we wanted to do. We were willing to put in the work and effort. We didn't necessarily need someone encouraging us and motivating us to like be doing the work. We were already there. Um, but the education piece, that was really where we, you hear on podcasts and people, which is good of people sharing you know, very expensive mistakes they've made, hard lessons learned with other people's money. That just seemed very scary for us. I mean, we were investing in our deal. I mean, we still continue to invest in our deals, friends and family investing in our deals. So we wanted to do everything in our power to prevent ourselves from making these expensive mistakes. So for us, it was worth it to invest $30,000 in a coaching program to prevent making a $30,000 mistake, essentially by having someone with 20 plus years experience overlooking all our underwriting. And then it really gave us that confidence to start, start submitting offers. You know, if we have someone looking over our deals, uh, looking at the underwriting, the market, our business plan and saying, Hey, this is a good deal. Go ahead and move forward. It gave us the confidence to start submitting the offers. Yeah, that's because, you know, people sometimes, you know, like, oh, you shouldn't have to pay for education. It's all available online. You just got to look for it. But I think what's missed in that is uh, the network that a lot of these programs come with. Um, a lot of people in a like minded uh, mindset, all for the same goals. I found both programs I've been invested in very uh, generous with knowledge. So, I mean, it can really accelerate the education nuts and bolts side of it. Cause yeah, clearly you, you have no problem with the execution side of it. Um, but uh, without the underlying foundation, it's a great, I always found it a great way to just consolidate that portion of the growth into a program, you know, a roadmap basically. Yeah. The program, I mean, I get asked all the time, like which program would I um, recommend or did what, what did I like and not like about mine? And I think it's good to take into consideration all the other programs out there. When I first jumped into multifamily, I really only knew a couple big names doing it. And I dove head first into the first coaching program that I really discovered. And then after now having been in the multifamily realm for a while, I've seen all these other people and operators and how they have different coaching programs. So I think it's important to kind of research other ones out there. And then also taking into consideration, like all of them are a little bit different in terms of what they're really providing for you. And I love that you mentioned the networking piece because coming into this, I didn't really think that that was going to be such an important part of the coaching program. But now after having been in it and seeing really what a team sport multifamily is and how important those networking type of events and communities are to taking down these big deals. I mean, they're so essential. And I remember even joining my first multifamily mastermind thinking, what am I really going to get out of this? Like everyone on here is like going to be an operator trying to raise money from LPs. It's too much conflicting of interest. I didn't really see how it was going to be super beneficial or productive. But then after I hopped on my first call, it was so amazing to find out that there was um, insurance brokers on the call. There was mortgage brokers. There was property management companies. There was different software and products. There's all these people on these calls. There's LPs on the call, other GPs looking to partner with people. There's all these people on these calls that just create this huge community. And you go out into these mastermind or meetup events or networking groups and just say kind of what you're looking for, what you're working on. And then you naturally gravitate towards other people when you can create these great working relationships. So it's just a really mutually beneficial place to start hanging out. That's a great point. You find that all those different realms of people that, that join. We, I, I hear often limited partners, uh, LPs for our listening audience, this man referred to that join a, a coaching network, a, a coaching platform just for the network because they're trying to become a GP mm -hmm. uh, or meet the person that will allow them to become a GP. And these people have 2000 plus doors as, as LPs and been doing this for two, three, four, five years, whatever the case may be. So I definitely think there's a benefit that you can't always just put on paper. Uh, hey, here's what our coaching program can provide for you. You've got to talk to others and, and find out what that is for you exactly. Mm -hmm. I, and I, 
at what point did you, uh, before you did your very first syndication, did you realize maybe through your leadership skills or, or a talent ability that, hey, uh, Susie, best friend, nurse uh, person also, here's what I'm doing, uh, you should look into it. Or did you have to uh, build, did you have that natural organic ability to, you know, bring people along with you, you know, friends and family, like you said, coworkers, or did you have to build that up, prove yourself after you've done your first one? What, what did that shape up uh, for you guys like? So a little bit of both for sure. I mean, doing your first deal, you don't have the experience and necessarily the credibility. So for that first multifamily deal, it was a small raise. We raised like 250, 300,000 from family and friends. And that was really going on the foundation of them trusting us as people, them knowing what we've done in our professional career, what we've done, you know, within our marriage and raising our kids, just how we are as people and putting out that kind of them trusting us in that respect, not necessarily with real estate at this point, but being able to leverage other successes we've had in our life and different skill sets that we have to now apply to real estate, they were willing to jump in with us and move forward on that first deal with us. After we did that first deal, of course, we still raise with friends and family who know us and now see what we're doing and having success at it. But then that gave me the motivation and encouragement to start talking to healthcare professionals about it. And natural, and at first it came out very naturally and genuine in terms of like me being super stoked off real estate and just sharing what I've been doing. I mean, even at work when people ask what I'm doing on the weekend or how was your weekend? What, what do you got going on? Like it always involves real estate. So I'm usually saying, Oh, I'm flying up to Oregon to look at a new property or I'm doing a webinar for this, that, and the other. So it naturally kind of, I just share that stuff. And then it generates so much interest with people I work with, you know, especially medical professionals who are super busy, very advanced in their career. Um, are, are intrigued by investment strategies and creating wealth, but don't necessarily know a lot about it. Don't have the time and energy to be investigating just different real estate strategies out there and not necessarily wanting to manage properties and get the financing for it. So the syndications are really the perfect model of us coming together with other people who want to passively invest in these deals, hand over their money to us. And then we use it to operate the deal, rule out our business strategy and create great returns for our investors. It really, was the perfect fit. And that was, um, me just kind of identifying. And as we were creating our business, just different marketing strategies, our avatar who, because when you, we first came into this, we, we didn't, it can be very salesy and coming across of like trying to get people to jump in with you. And we, didn't really want to do that. We had no interest in capital raising. We were thinking after we did our first deal that we were going to partner with other capital raisers because we didn't want to be that person doing that piece of it. But then as we started learning more about the business, we felt we had to develop some sort of brand and foundation for people to come in, check us out and see what we were all about. So when we, it came to deciding how we were going to go about this, we wanted to do it in the most genuine way possible. So for me, that was launching the net worth nurse and being able to talk about about talk to medical professionals who I have this natural relationship with already. And then about real estate. I love it. It's a natural platform that you, you could, you, you saw it. It was already there. You just had to put all the pieces together. Uh, Greg and I are huge believers in, I don't care if you've done 10 syndications, they're ultimately investing in you, not yeah. necessarily the numbers on the paper or the asset, um, e even after your first one. And, and we're big on, you know, people ask you, what did you do this weekend? And you always say some reference to real estate. That means you're constantly dripping on them with info, but you're not shoving it down their throats. And that's being genuine, not salesy. And that's what you've been able to, I love the, uh, the healthcare platform, whatever you want to call it, medical provider, because yeah, to your point, these high six figure or plus earners that they're, they're so into their careers uh, and no time, but it can really make a difference in their life if they want some time freedom eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know a couple of other partners slash investors that, that do the same thing, just kind of tap into people. And so let's talk about that platform. Do you um, host regular webinars to share with people what you're doing, whether you have a deal or not, and just letting them know the opportunity? What does that look like as far as sort of marketing to those people, if you will? Yes. So building a brand has been a bit of a learn and pivot as I go. I mean, I launched my brand six months ago and it was really 
um, with building an education platform. So after we did that first deal, we were constantly referring to pe- people, our investors to other like operators out there who had really good YouTube videos, good educational material. Like we didn't have that built. And so when people were coming to us, like, what is a syndication? Like what, like, can you describe it a little bit more? We were referring people to other people's stuff and saying like, this is basically what we were doing. And we felt like that wasn't really the best way to go about it. I mean, if they're going to be investing with us, they want to kind of see it coming from our mouth. So we, that was on the point was like, okay, we need to start creating our content ourselves. So it was getting in front of a camera, doing YouTube videos, writing blogs, hopping on podcasts. For me, podcasts are super important because that was like the biggest thing that I did to educate myself on real estate. I was, I mean, even now driving to work, my commute, I'm sitting on podcasts, listening to hearing people's stories, so motivational and inspirational. So me is my goal of hopping on podcasts is to connect with other big people in the field, like your, yourselves, and then share my story to hopefully it resonates with people or motivates and inspires people to get into real estate investing. And so that was kind of the main, um, motivation behind doing that. But then it's allowed me to really create my brand and launch it and market and put myself out there. And now a lot of people have heard me on podcasts and they reach out to me and I get to connect with them that way, which is super, super awesome. And then in terms of doing like the webinars and that sort of stuff, like I do work full time. I too have two young kids. So as much as I want to launch my own podcast and do my own meetup and do all the things, it is so time consuming to market yourself. Like be even being on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, like that is a full time job that you could be doing, sitting on those platforms, interacting with people, posting material and content. So I'm really just trying to be super strategic about what I'm doing. So for me, it's doing a hundred podcasts in a year. Like that was one of my main goals. And then I'm doing a certain amount of Instagram or posts, uh, through Facebook and LinkedIn as well, just to kind of connect with my investor base that way. That's a great point that you made there, um, about finding a way to, to still accomplish the networking side of it. Cause there's been so much buzz around what to do during COVID is I start a podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, that's the route we took, but we're also, you know, full time in this. So it's maybe a little bit easier for us to incorporate it into our day. You're the inverse still, um, incredibly busy with a W2 family. So just switching that on its head is like, I will just be the guest. Mm -hmm. And I will fit it into my schedule because no longer, you know, do you have to make time? It's a different way of making time. You're taking what flexibility you have and leveraging it on other people's platforms instead of creating your own. Exactly. In in regards to your marketing, you just, what you just said before Greg uh, spoke, uh, have you thought about and or do you utilize virtual assistants? Anybody else helping you? It's all you currently. What does that look like in the future for you? It is all me currently. I have toyed with the idea and looked into virtual assistants. I actually went through the process of interviewing a couple uh, last month and just recommendations from other people that I've done podcast episodes with who use them on a regular basis for like editing for their podcast videos and that sort of thing. And I was looking into it for video editing and blog writing essentially, but I just have such a difficult time letting, um, someone do that piece of my business, because that's really how I come across. And those are my words coming out to my investors and audience and avatar. So it's very hard for me to have someone else like write a blog for me in my words, and then push it out and say, like, I kind of did that. Although I know a lot of people do that. And it's editing based on myself, there's ways to make it work for sure. And I'm definitely trying to learn more about that, but it is like a very, fine line behind handing over your business and your voice to someone else, as opposed to like you really being genuine with your avatar and pushing out what you want to say to them. Yeah. I, I totally understand that. I would think that in the future, if your husband, once your husband's income has been replaced, because we know that's what you're trying to do and, or you, uh, that maybe you would take that on Yeah, well as do your own podcast and whatever else. Mm-hmm. But I do, uh, love how you're leveraging other people's time because that's what it's all about Mm -hmm. Um, instead of doing totally everything yourself or having your own podcast if you will 
Definitely. Have you thought about using dictation? This is something I haven't used, but it was a tip that somebody said how they write blogs is that they basically use dictation. So on the same drive where you might be listening to a podcast, they would just dictate the blog and then send it off to somebody and they would do more of an editing and, and clean up on it. So, you know, 85% of your voice is probably even more of that is still preserved. So now they're just taking your, your audio and putting it into text. That might be a way to preserve. Cause Definitely. I'm the same way. I'm like, ah, you know, I don't want to have somebody create content cause I just feel like it's yeah. little, it seems a little disingenuine to me. That's, that's my hang up on it. Right. And I mean, a lot of people out there do it and make it work. So I'm not knocking it at all. I think there's yeah. really good, but exactly how you were saying, I mean, that was kind of the route I was going down where it was like writing and creating a blog. And then, um, so my words, putting it into a blog, then getting in front of a camera and just seeing it, uh, reading it out as like a five minute video and then paying someone to have that edited and then pushed out onto my social media channels. That was really more the route that I was mm -hmm. going down of like, you know, using your own words, but then creating it in a video, but then let every, someone else do all the work because video editing is no joke. That takes a long time. And even like, you know, developing the blog, even if you write it, then ha doing the graphics and uploading it onto your website and then pushing it out onto all your so so social media channels, it does take a lot of time and effort to even do something like as small as that. Yeah, because, uh, you know, Kim, my wife, does all of that for us. And it takes a significant amount. Of, and we're right now, just like this week, we're in the process of, all right, let's make a list of everything you do. Mm -hmm. And let's figure out if we're getting the right amount of return on it, to some yeah. extent, um, and trying to figure out, okay, do we have to hand some of this stuff off because as you know these you know putting these deals together is that's by gosh that's also time consuming yes and certainly takes precedent over marketing because uh but you know as you add more deals it's going to take up more time away from potentially uh, your time available to do this other stuff so at some point shifts will have to be made so you know you're proactively thinking about what that's going to be yeah it's i don't know how you do it <laughs> I was like, I'm like, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm really constantly just learning. Like I hear from a lot of people, even when I was telling someone, I was like, my goal was to be on a hundred podcast episodes. He was like, that's such a waste of time. Why are you doing that? That's not where your time and energy needs to be. You need to be doing these weekly webinars. That's where you need to be focusing your time and energy. And I'm like, really? Like, I don't know. Okay. So then I did that one webinar and it was a decent amount of work. I mean, preparing a pre PowerPoint presentation and it just goes to show like, you're constantly growing in this and nothing comes easy because I created that PowerPoint slide, like at a whole foods one morning, knocked it out in like an hour and a half made this whole PowerPoint. I'm like, cool, perfect. I'm going to be ready for my webinar. And then I get in front of my husband and I'm like, Hey, let me just run through this with you real quick. Give me some feedback. And I go to run through that first slide. And it takes me like 30 minutes because I'm constantly like stopping, like the natural speeching speech, getting up in front of people and presenting doesn't come naturally to me. And it took me like hours and hours to practice for that one webinar and presentation. And I know it gets easier over time. And as you start talking about the same topics and um, just different terms within real estate investing, it gets easier, but it does take a lot of upfront work. Like it just, it was such a humbling reminder to be like, this doesn't come easier naturally for anyone. Like people are putting in the work for it. Like if you see people out there speaking in front of hundreds of people, like they did have to start somewhere. So don't feel like discouraged and run down because you're getting stuck. You know, I was just almost like, Oh, I give up. Like, I don't even want to do this webinar anymore. It's too hard, but it was like, okay, no, I got to do it. And then, um, I generated good interest from that and people reached out to me from it. So I'm just, especially being six months for within launching my plan, I'm like constantly evaluating like what's been the best use of my time. Like you just mentioned for your wife of like, okay, I did this webinar. This is how much hour, how many hours it took me the time and effort. And like, this is how much interest I got from it. Like, this is how many people reached out to me from it. Like me constantly doing podcasts. I have people reach out to me all the time. And that's because, you know, at the end of recording a podcast episode, I really encourage people to reach out to me because I do love connecting with other people out. I've created great partnerships. I brought on people as GPs in my deals who want to learn how to take down these syndication deals. And it's really just from, going out here, sharing my message, what I'm doing and opening my arms to reach out to anyone who's interested in connecting.
you mentioned something early on and you sort of just touched on it in a roundabout way, basically jumping in and figuring it out along the way. And uh, you, you, you can never, and you're constantly learning. You said that, that's what we, that's the mindset that we have. We don't know it all. We'll never know it all. We don't pretend to know it all. This is who we are, like, love it or hate it. Um, we figured it out along the way. We're still figuring stuff out along the way. But it, Greg commented on, it's your ability to execute. And you, you may not know how you're going to do it when you first start out, but you have to figure it out and then you just go do it. Um, it's not about the best possible way to do it or just do it, get it done. And I think that's where people struggle. They even struggle investing in these coaching programs and they just won't pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. on number one doing the work or thinking they have to have everything set up perfectly so uh, i commend you on just jumping in and and figuring all that stuff out along the way as you go uh let's gonna talk grab, about oh i was gonna grab sorry, a sweet man. segue there you said yeah, go go <laughs> it's your talk. segue man i don't mean to take well your it's it's that massive action type thing and i think you know when you're talking about getting seriously into multifamily syndications or opening a franchise or anything that is well involved and maybe outside of your scope, it, you have to like commit. So if you clearly, you, you know, you guys have committed um, a couple of things I, I saw that you did to get started are things that I also did was uh, use money from a four, and correct me if I'm wrong, use money from a 401k and, and mm -hmm. grab an equity out of your house. I mean, how did you, those are big decisions to make. I've talked to people about that, you know, people that are paying off their house and I'm just like, mm. <laughs> you know, I want to just like, yeah. you're making no money on your equity. <laughs> you know, so, you know, personally, how did you come to those decisions and, um, and finally decide that, um, yeah, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So much of what you just mentioned. I love Because I went right through it. I'm like, <laughs> a lot of it, I'm like, yeah, I, I don't want my money when I'm 65. I might not make it to 65. You know? Right. No, it's a huge mindset shift. And that's where it comes into play so, so much that you don't even realize the mindset piece of doing this real estate. I mean, for me, it was listening to the podcast and listening to all these people that were doing it and taking these big quote unquote risks of pulling out a second mortgage on their home, tapping into their retirement accounts. Like I've always been taught and felt that that's like super risky. Like the best way to invest for your retirement is to do small index funds, invest through fidelity or whatever carrier your employer has set up for you. And that's how you save for retirement. And that was really all I learned. But then as you start networking and talking to other financially savvy people, the home equity thing is huge for me. When I hear people talk about it too, I also cringe and try and explain to them pulling out a second mortgage from their home, which is how we got started in investing in real estate at 4%, investing it in something that's making you 15, 20%, just mathematically, when you look at the number side of things, it's so huge. And that's really been our biggest point when we're talking to other people is just showing them the numbers because the numbers don't lie. And behind all the feelings of not wanting to get started or feeling it's risky or being reserved, it's, it's something that they, when you see it, it, the numbers, it gives you the foundation and the knowledge that, oh, okay, maybe this does make sense. Mm -hmm. It's still tough. I mean, you know, I remember the, like sending a wire the first time to mm -hmm. invest. I'm like, well, like, oh, okay. Maybe it is. It, it's super scary, but then and I then think it's like very, it's very boring after that. You send it. You're yeah. Like, I guess I'm going to have lunch now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> but I love when you eventually are able to share with someone that's teeter tottering on the line that you took that risk and it's paid off for you. That generally pulls them across. Uh, we've got a friend slash partner who created his own spreadsheet for busting up his 401k and showing anybody that wants to see it what the return would be for the next five years versus taking that same money and putting it in a specific syndication or joint venture opportunity. And I guarantee you he's talked to at least half, 10 people and probably more than half of them are like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was sense. amazing. He's like, hey, Greg, I'd love your opinion on this. And he cracks <laughs> open this spreadsheet. I'm like, I don't think there's anything I could possibly add. Right. To I think it's this conversation. I, to me, it look, I looked at it as like, He's doing this 
continually trying to convince himself to do it. I mean, he's trying to be responsible and everything, but we all do that in some certain way. And, and his, his way is through a spreadsheet. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you're constantly trying to justify that you're making a good decision. And we're certainly not advocating for like doing things recklessly. You can right. use equity that you have tied up in other places responsibly to, to, get started or or redeploy in a different way so you know don't don't mishear what we're saying is like yeah just you know, it's just money no it's <laughs> not just money it's your future so yeah the education piece is so huge of educating sir yourself of what really are the risks and rewards of pulling out your retirement account we pulled it out under the cares act so it was penalty free yes we're paying taxes on it but it's over a three-year period this is what and we we did the same sort of thing like we got a spreadsheet we were talking to our coach in the mentoring program about doing this and toying with the idea of pulling out 100k from our retirement account to start getting invested well, to keep doing deals in real estate. And he gave us a, a spreadsheet, really just three rows of this is what a hundred thousand would do in a stock market. This is if you were to invest through a self-directed IRA, what your money would look like through that. And basically just basic mathematical formulas of like a six to 9% return through the stock market. And then this is what it would look like in real estate. If you're getting conservatively, maybe a 15% return or something like that. And just looking at the numbers at the end of 10 years was just mind blowing. And so that education piece of looking at it. And then for us, I think it was talking to people who we think are very financially literate and hearing what they're doing and they're all doing it. So it was like, Oh, these guys seem super smart and they're pulling from their retirement accounts to invest in real estate. It seems like a secret weapon, but it's really not. I mean, it's very much out there. People pulling from their second mortgages. I mean, I've talked to guys who want to invest, who are pulling from their life insurance policies. Like this one guy, him and his wife both pulled from their life insurance policies. They were pulling out second mortgages and doing refinances on like six single family homes at one time and investing in all these passive deals as, um, or all these syndications as passive investors and just creating all this passive income wealth, um, just growing really what they have over a period of time. The longer I'm in this business, the more you hear about the most wealthy people are all in real estate. It's mm -hmm. just a general statement that you mm -hmm. hear people make. Hey, it's Greg from Real Wealth Solutions. If you'd like to know more about our passive income opportunities, jump on to realwealth.solutions and hit that schedule a call button. We're always happy to talk about our multifamily and flip projects and to answer any questions you may have. Again, that's realwealth.solutions. We look forward to hearing from you. And now back to the podcast. Let's talk real quick, if you don't mind. Um, what's the what's a typical asset look like for you guys? Not necessarily numbers, but I mean, physically, number units, things like that. You've identified this honey hole sweet spot in Oregon. Um, what city is it in? No, I'm just kidding. So a couple of different cities throughout <laughs> Oregon. Uh, we have one on the coast in North Bend, Oregon, one in Roseburg, which is just right on the five. It's a pretty big city. And then we're doing one right now up in Pendleton, which is like Eastern oh, Oregon. Yeah. So all throughout Oregon. And honestly, we really just started looking in that market out of curiosity. My parents live up there. And when we first started running numbers and practicing our underwriting, we were exploring all different markets and just looking what all these different underwriting factors look like in different markets just to get more practice, more knowledge base. And we started looking in Oregon because we know the market very well. My parents are up there and we, we found a good deal and just ended up reaching out to a broker about it. And it was a very strong value add, a 12 unit million dollar price point. We went in and purchased that one. And then after our broker saw that we did that one, he started sending us pocket listings. He, I mean, we just awesome. communicated very well with him, just created this great relationship. And he sent us a 24 unit, um, that one's in Roseburg. So it's like a smaller deal that we have been able to do on our own, raise money from our network of people. And then the next one was an 18 unit. So although even after the 24 unit, we were like, okay, let's go look in Reno. That was another market we were looking at and looking for a bigger deal and kind of looking to partner with another GP team. But our broker just sent us this other, you know, smaller sweet spot deal, an 18 unit that we're like, okay, we can raise the money for this one. And it had just amazing returns. So we're like, okay, let's knock this one out. 
out and then maybe look in a different market. So we're just rolling with what we have and what, I mean, when a deal's good and too good to pass up, we've just been kind of there in the Oregon market, but we're definitely open to other markets and different deal sizes as well. We're, we're all about the smaller size uh, because everyone, you know, the I'll call them professional syndicators are looking at the hundred and up or institutional yeah. money or family office money or whatnot. Um, uh, two things, two questions pop in my head. Number one is Oregon, a landlord friendly state. We like to ask or no. And then number two, do your parents invest with you? So Oregon being a landlord friendly state, I'd say it's probably out of all the states, not one of the most friendliest. It does have rent control, but it's 9.1% for 2021. None of our business plans involve raising rent over 9.1%. So okay. um, people hear Oregon and they think rent control like they do in California. But I mean, it's it's a high it's a high percentage, 9.1%. Okay. So we make it work with our deals. That's never been a deterring factor. Um different things like eviction play, like those are all in place, you know, with COVID, uh, but there's different grants that the state of Oregon has to offer landlords for reimbursement of uncollected rent and that sort of stuff. We haven't had to use it on any of our properties yet, but it is in our back pocket in case anything were to come up like that. Um, it's also a very energy efficient state. So they very much incentivize landlords for implementing different energy efficient fixtures like water conservation. Um, they send you all the products and fixtures for free. It's pretty amazing. And then wow. we're using it to decrease our expenses in these buildings, That's not beautiful. toilets. Those are the only things they don't do, but they do okay. faucet aerators, shower heads, led strips, light bulbs. They send you all like this huge package for free for all your units. And you just go in and implement it. So pretty amazing things like that, that the Oregon, the state of Oregon does do. Um, my parents have not invested with us yet. They're not really in a financial place where they could do it, but my um, in-laws have, and then a couple of aunt and uncles that I have in Oregon that have invested with us. Uh, one thing I was going to mention is, you know, you guys being open to other markets and you're starting to look, I think what you'll find naturally, and it will happen if it's not all happened already. What happened with Greg and I is East Tennessee is our main market, but we are, have started to get approached. So now we, you know, we're part of a syndication in Wichita, Kansas. And now other people, when you prove your experience and your worth and just that you can get stuff done, more people will reach out to you and, and approach you about partnering in different markets, knowing that you can do it. Uh, I think that's, I think it's really cool in that, hey, your hard work's paying off your experience mm -hmm. and, and, and your belief, their belief in you as a, as a person, partner. Um, what have you. So uh, sounds like that's already occurring for you. It's well, just a great feeling. To me, that was a huge accomplishment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, to uh, diverse into another market. Yeah, it was. I mean, I really like repeating in the same market because it just gets easier and you're like, okay, if there's all these nuances in this market that I'm fairly familiar with going to a new, you know, going somewhere else is like, I'm going to have to try and figure out those nuances over there too. So as long as we, I mean, we had somebody that's very strong filling the boots on the ground role. So, you know, we got comfortable with that, but um, I started investing from out of state. I lived in Alaska and that's where we started. So everything was, you know, kind of similar to what you're doing. So it could be, it could be hard to figure out how to have some credibility, you know, traveling, things like that. It's not the easiest thing to do to invest out of state. So I like the yeah. type thing. And knowing your market, I mean, that's huge. Like I've, I've had other, other GPs like approach me of like, Hey, look at this deal in Ohio, like to check it out. And I, I'm just like, I know nothing about Ohio. Right. Like I would have to start from ground zero of researching the market. What are rents there? What are good cities? What are good suburbs? What's the population trend? What's the occupational um, kind of diversity in the market? I, it takes so much work knowing your market and, and you should know it as an operator investing in a specific city or suburb, you should know really every aspect. Like what do people come there to do? What's the biggest employer? What, what do population trends look like? And we know that for our markets and like, yeah, I mean, like you're saying, it'd be difficult to move into another market. I mean, not hard. We would just have to start from zero and really educate ourselves on the market and learn about that and travel out there and see what it looks like. And it's doable for sure, but that's what makes it easy of us having the sweet spot in Oregon. It's like, yeah, we know the market when our broker sends us a deal in a specific suburb, we're like, Oh, okay. We know this one. This is a good, you know, we don't, it's not as much work. We already have our teams in place. We are familiar with it. 
Yeah, it's like <clears throat> you probably run into this where a broker sends you an opportunity and you already know the property because you've just, it was either on the market a couple of years ago or you've just driven it or done it. Greg's great at doing stuff like that. He's already familiar with what's going on uh, yeah. more so than, than myself. Yeah, you could, you could look at your old underwriting and say, oh, we should have bought it because now it's like <laughs> yeah, exactly. some dollars more a unit. I'm like, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you obviously with your, professional experience uh, as a nurse and your leadership and all that, you've got probably a ton of medical professionals reaching out to you, but I want to ask specifically, it's going to be a dumb question, but I'll ask anyway, because I want the listeners to hear, do you have a lot, just being female, do you have a lot of females that reach out to you? Not only just maybe nurses, but in general, because they probably attracted to your energy, just what you have going on, all that good stuff. Is that common? Yeah, I lo- I've never been asked that on a podcast. That's surprisingly, mm-hmm. but I I love 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 connecting with women. I have a sister. I have two daughters. Women empowerment and just that sort of thing is just very huge for me. And um, that is honestly like one of the most intimidating factors of coming into this field was it's a very much male dominated. And even just looking at operators and syndicators, I'm like, oh, there's already like a couple of men out there doing what I'm doing, catering to um, medical professionals and doctors and nurses and that sort of thing. So there was a couple of people already doing it and thinking the imposter syndrome of like, I don't fit in this space. I, there's already people out there doing it. What, what do I have to offer people that's better or different than these other operators that are already doing what I want to be doing. So that was a huge mindset switch for me of getting over that. And I mean, so much encouragement from my husband and just my family of like, you can definitely do it. And, um, coming into the field for sure. I do have probably more women reach out to me and I've done women specific podcasts and just a part of different women communities. And I love that piece of it. Um, and it's, yeah, it it does happen for sure. I figured that was the case. And with your mindset, and leadership and just the, your attitude. I, I thought, yeah, that you've got to be touching some people out there that probably, probably you're, you're probably doing a little bit of life coaching, not even realizing you're doing it, whether you are or not uh, with pulling them across the line too, just helping them realize the opportunity. Cause it is a male dominated, I'm going to say sport, but industry. Um, well, what was it when um, I was, when I was back in Alaska and you and Kim went to the event and uh <laughs> People would come up to Kim and say, like, oh, you're Greg's husband. And she would say, no, um, Gre- what the hell would she say? She spun it around. And he goes, no, he's my, no, you're Greg's wife. He goes, no, he's my Oh, wife. no, he's my husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he's my husband. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, Kim's not huge on being in the limelight, but she does all this BS work behind the scenes that nobody wants to do or knows that she does and there's no it's way not bs do. work i'm gonna throw the red flag well, <laughs> i'm sorry i just i didn't mean it that way but yeah i know what you meant but yeah yeah there's a lot of stuff <clears throat> a lot of stuff it's not realized yeah. That's definitely how, what my husband does. Like when we were thinking about doing the brand, he was like, mm. I do not want to have any part of being in front of a camera and going out there and being the face of the business. So he definitely does all our acquisitions, underwriting, asset management. I noticed that. I was wondering how, you know, did you guys split roles up a little bit? Uh, you know, like in our partnership with Darren, he tends to be more out in front, does more than networking and I'm, mm. you know, drinking coffee at a... <laughs> <laughs> the fun stuff, you know, doing spreadsheet stuff and we both share roles and I certainly can interact, but d- was that a fairly conscious decision or, or comfort level decision or, or, or do you see, you know, maybe that, uh, that may change at some point? Um, I mean, it's flexible for sure, but we did that first syndication deal, the 12 unit, like side by side, every piece of it, we were doing all the investor calls together. We were on the phone with the brokers and the lawyers together. We were looking at the underwriting together, creating like our presentational marketing, um, material for investors together. And then kind of after we did that first deal side by side, we really wanted to understand the foundation and all aspects of the business. And then we naturally started gravitating towards different pieces. Like at first, so I oversee operations in the hospital. I manage multiple departments. I do process improvement, uh, communication, that sort of stuff. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to do asset management. Like this seems like in, in line with what I do at work, but honestly dealing with contractors for that first deal was so frustrating for me. I mean, I know I do work in a hospital setting, so it's a little more, 
Um, people are, are quicker to do things, but just the lack of, I don't know, just communication Urgency. and attention with the contractors drove me nuts. I could not do it. <laughs> so I handed that over to my husband very quickly and he's super patient. He just is really good with that sort of stuff. And so he now does all the acquisitions. So he does underwriting. He has the relationships with our brokers. He's getting the deals, underwriting them and, um, doing the asset management. And then I've steered more towards the marketing and the investor relations and the communication piece. Okay. Yeah. I mean, cause eventually you run out of time yes. to do everything yourself. So, uh, yeah, we have a running list for our projects and there's an L next to it for my husband's name, Lupe and an S next to it for me. And we work on different pieces of the business now at this point. I mean, we do come together. I mean, probably every day, every other day and just say, Hey, where are you at with this piece? Where are you working on with this? And, um, that's kind of just how we organize different pieces of our business. And I mean, kind of like we were talking about before, which is the women thing. I mean, I've, it was, I felt when I originally looked at it, it was like maybe a disadvantage, but now I use it huge to my advantage. I mean, I used to, my first mastermind group I hopped on was with six or seven men and it was just so intimidating. And now I'm, I just like own it. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to be the only woman on this car call. Like it just kind of sets me apart, I think from other people out there. So I just really use that and just push out the brand heavily with that. Well, and you've recognized that whether organically or just happened or whatnot, that you connect with people that your husband will not be able to connect with mm -hmm. no matter what they're yeah. doing in the industry. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I guess my only exposure would be, or I would think would be I've, I've heard the cautious about branding as yourself in that you can only be in one place at one time. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in a partnership, like, like with our meetup, say me and Darren, okay, if I can't make it, he can still go that kind of thing. So um, there may be some limitations to it, but also Ah, whatever. It's just one of those things. You can completely overthink it like I am on a podcast right now. <laughs> no, I've definitely. So even thinking about doing a meetup, I've connected with a couple of other nurses of doing like a net worth nurse uh, meetup. And my goal was even my husband's like, you got to get someone else to help you with it in case you can't meet it for whatever time. I mean, my schedule is so busy. So as much as I want to do a meetup, my goal, and I've been talking to another nurse about doing it together. So like you're saying, she can pick up the slack if I'm not there one week or we can kind of offset some of that work. And because I've branded as the net worth nurse, we can really push out the meetup. It's not my meetup. It's like a nursing meetup type thing. So we're really kind of toying with that idea right now. That's true. Yeah. Cause it's not your name. Yeah, right. Exactly. Oh, okay. So, um, well, we're going to have to wrap it up a little bit. Yeah. I, just for sake of, I know you got a lot of education and a podcast we have as well from the organizational side. I mean, are you, are you utilizing any apps, any tools that you use that have found are working for you? I know for me, when I hear people talk about that, I'm, if I hear a lot of repetition, Asana, Asana, yeah. <laughs> this or that, I'm like, okay, I might just have to break down and finally look at one or two of these things and see if it's, if it's worth it. So I love any, that like, you mind, asked that. Any mind blowing, like, oh, this was finally the one I landed on and it's been awesome. Um, so definitely Fiverr for outsourcing, like my website build, um, different things that I'm struggling with, like that piece. So Fiverr has been so amazing. You can check out different people on there. Um, I use active campaign for my CRM. I like it. I can really track a lot of different logistics within that. Um, I use like all the social medias, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and, um, that's really it. I haven't dove in too much into the app part. I love that you asked that. I haven't heard that on podcast, but now I'm wishing it's asked more so I can start using what other people are using. If you come yeah. across something, let us know. Greg's big on that yeah. stuff. Just more efficient no, processes and systems. Well, I am, but I really haven't found much that works as well as a pad of paper or the notes <laughs> on my phone. I mean, it's, it's, Sometimes I'm like, oh, here's a nap. And I'm like, now I got to spend 
time learning how to use it to take notes. I'm like, is that really necessary? Um, yeah. The Calendly lab app, actually, I use that yeah. for like scheduling and that's been a yeah. game changer. I mean, I use the free version of it, but I integrate mm-hmm. it with my Google calendar. And honestly, with so yeah. much going on, I never did that before I started doing real estate stuff. And it's just been a huge game changer and just trying to keep track of different meetings I have, especially with investors and setting up calls. Um, that's really streamlined that process. It's very, very easy. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Um, I've got one question and an okay. observation. This is totally, I've never asked this question before. Hey, this is our third never asked question before, I think, <laughs> to her count. So your background on your Zoom right now, it looks like in a little EKG yeah. monitor type thing. But also, I see the N for net yeah. worth and I also... Oh, well, there's a W. And a w. I see an N and a W in there for whatever that's worth. <laughs> no play on words. Yes, it is. Sorry, my, that's really cool. Yeah. One of my best friends does branding and he did it for Willow Investment Group when my husband and I started our real estate business. And I asked him to do my net worth nurse and I just love it. He did such a great job. I keep telling him he needs to go on Fiverr and start doing branding and logoing, but yeah, he doesn't do right. it. Yeah. You could just connect him with everybody in the same position as us and probably give them enough business because we're all high rollers just <laughs> throwing money around like nobody's business exactly. um savannah how do how do people reach out to you what's the best way to find you i uh, will drop it all in the show notes as well but if you're willing to give out contact Def- yeah definitely the net worth nurse so that's my website the net worth nurse you can find me under Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook under the net worth nurse. My email is Savannah at the net worth nurse. And I love connecting with other people. If you're remotely interested in anything I've been saying, please reach out to me. I would love to connect. All right. Right on. Darren, you want to take us out? Sure. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us on this episode of the Real Wealth Solutions Podcast. I want to thank our guest Savannah. And as always, I'm your co-host Darren Light along with Greg Scully. If this has been helpful to you or anyone else that you think might enjoy uh, hearing what Savannah had to say or share, uh, please uh, share it with them. Uh, Everybody have a great day. See you on the next episode. See y'all later. Thanks, Savannah. Thank you.